Praz Michelle joins me in Studio Q. Hello. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing well. Cool. So this story begins uh, with the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Um, what was your reaction when you first started to seeing these images? Um, a bit distraught. Um, I couldn't believe it. I just kind of like wanted to do something. Not mm -hmm. quite sure what it was, but I didn't just want to stand by and just let it just unfold in front of me. A lot of people tried to get involved by donating or 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 giving aid, but you wanted to get political. Yeah. Why? I never really believe in donation so much. You know, um, I think donation is fine, but it's also big business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever things start to get big business, the people who really, uh, that need the donation, the end user don't usually get it, you know. So I, I figured there's another way to help. And that's when I went and tapped in um, Michelle Martelli to um, run for president. Was that the first idea that came to mind? Like, I need to get to the root of this problem. I need to get in politics somehow. You know, I didn't think of it about getting into politics. You know, I think it was just a real innocent thought. It mm -hmm. was just, let's run for president. I didn't think about the particulars. Because I think if I did, I probably wouldn't have gone that far. I feel like those are the best ideas. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's, when you sit here and deal with the realities, we, I didn't know anything politically. You know, even though I'm Haitian descent, but I don't know the the terrain like that. I don't yeah. know anything about Haiti except for what I've read about of the, some of the history. But the people, the, you know, it's like 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 you're from Rwanda, right? Yeah. If you don't know, if you're not on a, that land to really understand the people and how they move, the mechanism, there's no way you're going to survive there. You know. So just this pure intention, like politics it was purely i thought that he can help to inspire the people because he was so regarded and revered as a musician so the story in the film it starts in 2010 but you do a great job going backwards in history and right. giving some context of the history of haiti what would you want people to know about the history of haiti well i mean we don't go deep deep but we give you an insight um where i think a lot of people will want to go do research but we want, we, part of the, I think, um, the director, Ben Patterson and myself, we wanted f for people to understand the impact that Haiti played in this side of the hemisphere. Mm -hmm. We're talking about North America, you know, the first black republic in 1804. You know, um, it's because of us, America was able to do that Louisiana purchase of 21 states because we defeated Napoleon. How, like, Chicago was discovered by a Haitian how New Orleans is all Haitian influenced because they brought us, you know, um, to America to help establish that when the France was getting a little bit crazy, how we helped during the Civil War, you know, our impact, and a lot of people don't know. And so, you know, I'm using this platform to spread that word around. In terms of platform, as a former member of the Fugees, how big were the Fugees in Haiti? Oh, Fuji's were like saying Michael Jackson. <laughs> because you got to remember, we were the first um, Haitian Americans to be mainstream, not just in America, but globally. And so it made Haitian feel very, very, very proud. Like, wow, these guys are repping it with the flag. Because there was a time I remember growing up, there's a lot of Haitian that would be fronting, you know, act like they from Canada. <laughs> you know, I'm Canadian. Or I'm French. <laughs> Man, shut up. You Haitian. <laughs> you know, so we were the first with like, man, we Haitian. Yeah. You know, and it just was like, wow. And then when we, when we start winning awards, selling millions of records, it was like, wow. You know, we took it to that level. So... Sweet Mickey is not the most conventional persona to run for president. Uh, he's shown in the film, shirtless, et cetera. Why did you think Sweet Mickey was the man for the job? Um, I thought Sweet Mickey was, like I said, you know, um, he was a great artist. Yeah, he was provocative, diaper wearing, taking his pants off. But, um, you know, sometimes in, when you look at history globally, um, sometimes when something drastic happens, you need 
what, what I call a reset button. Hmm. He was the reset. He was that guy like, we are not going to drown in our sorrows. Despite we had 200 plus thousand um, Haitian die during the earthquake, definitely condolences go out to all their families. But Haitians were like, it happened. It happened for a reason, but we're not going to stop. And we're just going to celebrate, and we need to celebrate. And I thought the best way for them to celebrate is to elect this unconventional guy who everybody knew him as a clown, hmm. you know. Now, obviously, this is, this is an election year. I think they're going this time around now a real, I, was, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say he wasn't real, but someone with, you know, real political experience could come in and really start to really get the country back on track. What was his reaction when you said, Michelle, I want I want you to run for president. He was shocked. <laughs> um, now, I wouldn't say down in deep in his heart he never had that ambition. I'm, he probably did, but you know, like like I wouldn't mind being president of the United States, but I know that'll never happen. You know, and I'm not going to even try to pursue it. But if somebody came to me, like a group of Republicans came to me and said, "Okay, Pross." The Koch brothers are like, we got $4 billion. Because the reason we got four, because you're black. So we're going to need four. <laughs> Matter of fact, we might need $6 billion <laughs> to even give you a chance. I'm gonna look at them like, really? You think so? <laughs> that's the next film right there. Yeah, I'm that's the next film. What, what I gotta lose? <laughs> Bronze for president coming out 2017. Oh my right. god. <laughs> um, but he, he took you up on it. Yeah. I, I think he was smart enough to realize what I could bring, you know, um, and like, you know, he, I think he looked at it like, look, worst thing, my popularity is going to go up even higher. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make another album and this time maybe go gold. I mean, I think that's how he probably was looking at it. But somehow, man, he made it through the second. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about that particular moment. But first, um, <laughs> so you guys threw your hat in the ring, Michel Martelly and yourself backing him up. And then, why Clef throws his hat in the mm -hmm. ring? What was your reaction when you heard that he was we running? We were shocked. We were shocked. We were just like, man. I mean, Michelle was scared. You know, because <clears throat> you got to remember, in Haiti, that is, Why Clef is the god. Hmm. You know, he's king supreme. And I think if, if I was advising Why Clef, I would have told him not to run. Because... He was so huge that he had to win. He had a lot to lose. Yeah, because you didn't win. So that means a lot of people look at it like, well, maybe you're not really that almighty. Huh. Right? Because, you know, everybody in you know, the United States of America, you know, have some kind of influence in the sense of like, you know, on what happens globally. So everybody knew like, okay, if Wyclef run, he gonna have the U.S. behind him because he's white cleft jump, you know, and he didn't win, and it was like, oh, it kind of like put a chip in his armor, you know. Hmm. Well, there were a lot of twists and turns in the story, as you mentioned. You guys make it to the second round. Hmm. That was like an unlikely moment. Right, right. What was going through your mind? What sort of doubts were going through your mind? It wasn't even doubts. It was more like, yo, we got here. It, you got to remember, it, the story is so bizarre. I mean, did we believe we could win? Yes, but we only believed it in a bubble world. Like, in our world, we thought we could win. Yeah. But if, in the reality, we didn't think. But, but we never thought about it at that moment. But when I go back in hindsight, there, there, there is, I mean... Okay, in order for me to put it in perspective, I'm sure your audience, your audience is probably familiar with Howard Stern. Yep. Think of it 
so in 2000, we had the Bush Al Gore um, election, mm-hmm. which it was controversial because Bush ended up winning because of the state of Florida. But imagine if Howard Stern threw his ring, th- threw his hat in, and the guy who supported him is Flavor Flay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, that's how crazy it was. And then the guy Howard Stern ends up winning. In the, that's mm. how bizarre. It, it, and by the way, how, it, 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 to to credit Howard Stern, at least he has some kind of credibility. I mean, yeah, the guy was controversial too, went to MTV in his underwear. It's kind of like similar to Michelle Martelly. Hmm. But when I tell you Michelle Martelly was something, the, the guy never owned a suit. <laughs> he bought his first suit. This is no lie. We bought our first suit. I bought his first suit in Canada. Because I was like, dude, man, you... you you gonna need to wear a suit, man. You gotta look presidential. He said, "Really? You think so?" I didn't even. I'm not even in Canada yet. I said, "But you trying to get people to think t- of you?" This yeah, yeah. So you gotta. He said, "Man, I ain't got a suit." I said, "When you got married, what did you do?" He said, well, "I rented the tux." Like literally, <laughs> I'm telling you. So right there, that tells you how crazy. It's just so crazy, and he won. I mean, I mean, well, he made it to the second round. Yeah. But what, like I said, and we didn't know why Cliff was running until two weeks before we went to register. We had, we had, mm. Everyone had to go register, right? Man, people were scared. Because mm. White Clef had about $20 million to start off in his treasure chest. We had about mm, 60000 What? Yeah. Committed. In actual hand. Cash, yeah. we had about maybe seventeen thousand dollars cash. So that tells you it was literally David and Goliath, you know. And the plot twist, they continue, you guys make it to the second round, and then you sparked a bit of controversy mid campaign during a TV um interview. You said that if Martelly doesn't win, the people will quote burn the country down. What goes through your mind when you listen back to that? I mean <clears throat> I probably shouldn't have said that, but I thought it was brilliant. It's great for the movie at that time. <laughs> yeah, it's great. But I mean, what I was doing, I was purposely trying to push the envelope without going overboard to Gardner attention from the international community. That's why I did all that, to be honest with you. Now, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing because I didn't want them to try to stop me, persuade me not to do it. Because my, my, my thoughts were, if I can get the international community to pay attention to the election and Michelle, then they will, in, they, would, they would have to protect him, which is the democracy or democratic process. Huh. That's how I was thinking. I didn't know if it was gonna work or not. I just thought, because you gotta remember, he is unknown. When I say unknown, I'm talking about like to the politicians, both in Canada and America, because the Canadian and American play a big role in the politics in Haiti. The diaspora, or you mean the government, like the government? The government, right? So if if I say if I say to you, if I give you a name, like if I say Laurent Lamont, you may not know who that is, but most politicians in especially high end, like the prime minister of Canada, Mm -hmm. they know who he is. America know who that is. But if you say Sweet Mickey or Michelle Martelly, they don't know. And then if they go try to Google to say, well, maybe he's a businessman or whatever, they see a guy with diapers on. So they're trying to figure out, well, what the hell is this? But now, if they're hearing that this guy have these supporters protesting, they have to pay attention because they... it's only to their benefit that the process democratically goes well because if it doesn't, then you're talking about instability, which affect the national security. That's how I was looking at it. I know it sounds like a lot, but... So where where did this the shrewd political campaign manager side of you come <laughs> from? It was, it was just... I just... I mean, I think I'm a pretty smart guy, but I've never mm-hmm. done politics before, so I was just looking at it like the art of war. Hmm. That's how I approach it. Like, I, I knew that White, when Wycliffe threw his hat in the ring, 
even though Michelle and his whole crew was scared, I'm the one that told Michelle, because Michelle was about to drop out. Because Wyclef, so I'm going to give you a little insight. It's not yeah. in the movie. But so Wyclef and Michelle, because Wyclef at this point found out that Michelle is running, obviously. This yeah. is two weeks before registration. Wyclef had a secret meeting with Michelle. I wasn't there. Wyclef doesn't know I'm behind this at this point. And Wyclef said, look, I hear you running, da, da, da. He said, listen, let me explain something to you, Michelle. You should wait till after I'm done because I'm going to win. After my five years, I'll support you. You win. And then after you done, I'll come back. But don't run against me now, dude, because I'm going to crush you. And he said, more importantly, I'm going to crush the person who put that thought in your head because I know it wasn't you that came up with this idea. So if you're going against me, that means you the opposition. I'm just going to have to destroy you guys, every last one of you. So that's when Michelle came back to me and was like, man, prize, yo, this guy has a lot of political influence. I don't think we can go against that. Let's just wait. I was like, man, forget that. I said, listen, you want to use that. Because when the world finds out that I'm going against him, it's going to bring attention that's going to help you come to the international press. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to get you international press. It's got to be something where it's like, mm -hmm. it's a story for them. So the story is like, ex-bandmate yeah. supports you. That's how I thought it was going to go, and it kind of like did go like that, too. <laughs> and in the end, your efforts paid off. Uh, Martelli is now Haiti's president. Take us back to that day for a second. What did it feel like when you won the election? Oh, man, it was surreal. It was like, wow. But it was more like I kept looking at it as what it's going to do for the country. You know, obviously now when I'm looking back at it four years later, you know, I look at all the things that happened, what could have happened, what didn't happen. But in that moment, mm -hmm. it was like, because this is the, that was the third Democratic election in 207 years. I mean, that, you got to remember, America is the first independent country in this hemisphere, right? Haiti's the second. About 60 years later. I mean, Haiti's the oldest black republic. The next country, black republic, to get its independence was Ghana in 1958. That's almost 150 years later. So with that deep history, it only had three democratic elections? I mean, that's deep when you think about it. So it was like, wow, it wasn't where anyone died or anything happened. Because usually when you're talking about Haitian election, it's war, man. I mean, people burn things. They, people get killed. This one was was virtually peaceful. Mm. They protested when he didn't get into the second round because they felt like who they voted for wasn't representing them, right? But no one died. No one got killed, which is major progress for a country like Haiti. So you were thinking more like, wow, I'm a part of history right now. I wasn't even thinking about I'm a part of history because I didn't look at it like that. I looked at it like, wow, he's going to come in and going to help to inspire the rest of the country, not just Haiti, but Haitians abroad, mm -hmm. and where we could come together and start to develop the country. Now, in hindsight, I look back at it like, okay, you know, I still don't look at it like I made history. I mean, people tell me, but I just look at it like that was my job. You know, it's it's it's... For me being blessed to do what I do as a musician, to have all the success, to me that was the least I can do is give back to 15 million Haitians that can't do it for themselves. And how do you feel about Sweet Mickey's presidency now? That's another segment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a few examples now of musicians going into politics. Um, what do you think an artist brings to politics? Wow, it, it's, 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 it's a very... It's a conundrum because artists like politics because they think that they can make a difference, right? And politicians love artists because the artists have the influence. So all the politician wants is the access to the voters. And the artists want what the politician have, which is the power to speak to the voters, right? But when you think about it, the fundamental of what both of them represent is night and day. It's like water and oil, right? Because as an artist, you all about expressing yourself creatively, the freedom to be able to express yourself, right? That's what makes us vulnerable, right? Yeah. 
the politician is the exact opposite. He's going to tell you what he thinks he needs to tell you to win a vote, right? So the fact that the artist and the politician want to get, it's like, it's like the nun and the thief. It just doesn't <laughs> yeah. make any sense. <laughs> it's deep. I was just thinking about this like two months ago. I was like, wow, this is deep. Yeah. That's why I could never be a politician because I'm going to say what I feel. I'm going to, and you can't do that as a politician. You got to, you have to restrain your thoughts and what your belief is. You have to give a general philosophy that everyone can follow. You can't tell them the truth, right? Hmm. Like, think of it. If, if, if I'm a government and I know there's an alien ship that NASA just told me it's an alien ship. They've seen the aliens. They've been in contact with the aliens. And the aliens are like, yo, we're going to come and max out right here in Ottawa. You can't tell the world that because it's going to be chaos. <laughs> How did Sweet Mickey make that transition? I guess he just had to. I mean, he, I mean look, <clears throat> he surrounded himself with a bunch of neophytes, mm -hmm. ex-musicians that became politicians. Right. And so they did the best that they could, you know, could have been better. Yeah, of course. But, you know, I mean, you got to really you got to really ha you got you have to really understand the world of politics, you know, to play politics. There's some that's been great and we've seen it right from Winston Churchill to Roosevelt. You know, that's not easy to get the general population to believe in a philosophy, right? Because usually people are divided, right? And, you know, that takes, it takes a certain individual to be able to pull that one off. Do you see someone on the horizon in, in Haiti's future who can have a philosophy and articulate it and get people behind it? I don't know yet. I mean, there's an election coming next month. Um, we're going to be able to see... Um, more the real candidates. I mean, look, 145 people registered to vote. I mean, that's ridiculous, mm. you know. But you can't be mad at them. They figure, hey, if the diaper guy can do it, why can't I do it? <laughs> right? I mean, it only makes sense, right? Yeah. So, you know, we got to go weed through all the BS, and then I'm going to see. Now, I'm not going to go as hard as I went with Michelle, but I'm going to see who I think I would support kind of like just help out, you know, but not go deep in. How did this whole um, story affect your relationship with Wyclef? Um, when, well, obviously during the campaign, he probably hated me, you know, as you saw in the movie where he said, you F me up, you F me up, whatever. Yeah, he was joking, but you know what they say, the truth is told through a joke, right? Mm -hmm. um, then we became cool. We cool. We yep. cordial now. Um, but I'm sure deep in his heart, he never expected that, you know, cause you gotta think about it. He's Wyclef Jean, right? Once again, the biggest Haitian superstar at that time. So me coming in, psh, whatever, but there's a great movie that I love called Scarface. Yep. And he said, there's a quote, he says, never underestimate the next man greed. And that's where he messed up at. Hmm. You see what I'm saying too? Yeah. Because he could have came to me and said, yo, what's going on? We would have backed up and backed him up. You know, but when Michelle came to me and said, he said, whoever gave you that idea. Now he had no idea it was me, huh. but he probably thought maybe it was the wife or a friend. He said, but whoever gave you that idea, cause you ain't that smart to think of this. Whoever gave you that idea, I'm going to crush that person first. That's what he said to Michelle. Um, last thing I want to ask you, how has making this documentary changed you? Um, just working with great people, you know, my director, Karen Rackman, my producer, being a filmmaker. I mean, my talent is not a politician. It just so happened I fell into this. Um, but being able to tell the story and get people inspired and get people to kind of like look at Haiti a different way. You know, what's great is to see, because, you know, it's your own people that's usually the hardest critics, right? Mm -hmm. But to get, you know, a lot of Haitians that have seen it, for them to love it and feel proud, that's like a great moment. And it just inspired me to keep doing more things 
of merit that has it still could be entertaining, mm-hmm. but things that matters, you know, to for everyone, you know, not just for Haitian, but just, like this movie right here, you don't have to be Haitian to to love this movie to get inspired because it's a human story where all is possible. I mean, look at Rwanda for example. That's where yep. you're from. If anybody know the story how with the war with the tribes and all that. And then at some point, because I met your president, mm-hmm. at some point for him to bring everyone together where now Rwanda has one of the fastest growing economy in Africa. That's big. Because if you spoke to them before that, people would tell you it, Rwanda will never get there. Yeah, You see what I'm saying too? Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing everywhere. It's the same story. It's just, it happens to take place in Haiti. Thanks, Praz. Thanks for having me, man.